Good afternoon. My name is Brendan Howe. I'm the new Dean of the Graduate School of International Studies at Ewa Women's University. And I'd like to extend a heartfelt welcome to all our students and faculty, as well as the larger Ewa community who are joining us on YouTube. It's a distinct honor to launch our latest Distinguished Global Lecture Series with not one, but two internationally renowned speakers who have also close connections with Ewa Graduate School of International Studies. First up, we have the president of Ewa Women's University and former dean of Ewa GSIS, Professor Unmi Kim, to give some welcoming remarks and also to introduce our second speaker with whom she has a lengthy working relationship. Then we have, giving the main lecture, former foreign minister of the Republic of Korea and the latest addition to the Ewa GSIS faculty, distinguished professor emeritus Kyung Wa Kang. I will be your moderator today alongside Professor Jennifer Oh, the DGLS Director. Professor Kang will speak on the topic of global challenges and leadership, and this will be followed by a Q&A session and an informal discussion up here on the stage. But first, I'd like to invite Pre President Kim to give her welcoming remarks. Good afternoon, dear students of Ihua, distinguished professor emeritus Kyung Hwa Kang, esteemed professors, staff, and alumni. Welcome to today's uh, special lecture organized by the Graduate School of International Studies of Ihua Women's University as part of its Distinguished Global Lecture Series, or to our students, DGLS. It is truly a distinct honor and privilege for me to introduce the very first speaker of the series for this fall, distinguished professor emeritus Kyung Hwa Kang. Earlier this month, Iha appointed former foreign minister Kyung Hwa Kang as the distinguished professor emeritus at the Graduate School of International Studies. In recognition of her outstanding career that spans from South Korea to the world, we are honored to invite her to the professorship so that she can educate and train the best leaders ready for the world's global stage at IHWA. Professor Kang received her BA in political science from Yonsei University and a master's and PhD in communication from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She was a professor at Sejong University, worked at the National Assembly, and in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as the Ambassador at Large for Global Affairs, Director General for International Organizations, and Minister at the Permanent Mission of the Republic of Korea to the United Nations. She then had a very distinguished career at the United Nations. In 2005, she chaired the UN Commission on the Status of Women. In 2007, she was appointed the UN Deputy High Commissioner for human rights. In this capacity, she promoted the human rights of all people around the world, and in particular, recognized the, that protection of women and girls in conflict is a critical but often neglected issue. Her attention to the victims of sexual violence in war and conflict remains a key agenda of hers. From 2017 to 2021, she served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea, the first woman and also the longest serving foreign minister of late. Minister Kong has left many important legacies and in particular contributed in lifting South Korea's global presence with the Women and Peace Initiative championed the importance of global cooperation during the COVID-19 pandemic, when many governments, many global leaders, turned away from international cooperation and support, and her commitment for sustainable development with climate change, global leadership, and civic responsibility. Today, distinguished professor emeritus Kyung Hwa Kang will deliver her speech entitled, Global Challenges and Leadership. She will present her thoughts on today's global challenges 
that threaten humanity and the earth, and what we must do to overcome such challenges as global leaders. Before I ask distinguished Professor Emeritus Kong to the stage, I would like to thank uh, Dean Brendan Howe of GSIS, Professor Jennifer Sejino, and the staff of the Graduate School of International Studies for preparing today's lecture. Now, please help me welcome distinguished Professor Emeritus Kyung Hang to the podium with a warm round of applause. If I may um, take off my mask. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, what a wonderful introduction. I'm truly humbled. This is my first activity as a faculty member of the IHWA Graduate School of International Studies, and I'm truly honored and delighted at becoming a member of the IHWA family. I'm deeply grateful to President Kim Eun-mi, Professor Yi in pyo Dean Brendan Howe, and others who have made it possible for me to take up this position. One of the most uplifting moments during my term as foreign minister was, in fact, when I engaged with IHWA students during a lecture here at the ECC in this very room uh, in the spring of 2018. The interest, energy, and responsiveness of the students who came to listen to me were just overwhelming and I had a hard time getting over the excitement. So after stepping down from the position of foreign minister earlier this year, when President Kim invited me to become a member of the Ihua family, I immediately said yes. I could think of no better way than to spend the next phase of my life immersed in the youthful, hopeful energy here on Ihua campus and be part of the efforts in educating the future women leaders for our country and the world. I truly regret that the ongoing pandemic prevents us from fully engaging in person. Going online for all kinds of human activity, including education and teaching, foreign policy and diplomacy, has been a trend in this digital age. But the pandemic has certainly accelerated it at warp speed, and it has led to higher productivity and efficiency in some areas of work and life. But there are certain human bonds that cannot be forged just online, such as the nurturing ties between teacher and student and the friendships that are made on campus and sustain you for a lifetime. So I earnestly hope that we will be able to recover some of the face-to-face -face interaction sooner rather than later and look forward to bringing the personal dimension to engaging with many of you. I thought much about what I should speak about today. So many topics and issues came to my mind that would be of interest to you, as I thought through the many years I've been in public service. Most recently, of course, as foreign minister of our country, that is a vibrant liberal democracy and the world's 10th biggest economy. For example, the changing geopolitical dynamics amidst the US-China competition, the momentum for peace on the Korean Peninsula, North Korea's increasing nuclear and missiles capabilities, the ROK-US alliance, the challenges in the relations with our neighbors, especially the difficulties in managing relations with Japan, our concerted outreach to Southeast Asia and Central Asia, Korea's growing profile at the UN and international development assistance, and during my final year being part of the government's efforts in dealing with COVID-19 and working with my foreign counterparts to forge cooperation and solidarity in the fight against the pandemic. And to do all this while pushing for gender equality and life-work balance in the ministry. And before this, in various senior positions at the United Nations, supporting the Secretary General in redesigning the peace architecture in the Secretariat and achieving gender parity in the UN, leading his transition team, 
coordinating the delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance to millions of people caught up in wars and natural disasters. Supporting member states in the development of global human rights norms. Working with reluctant and even hostile governments to improve their human rights records. And protecting and amplifying the voices of the victims of violations and abuses. I list these with humility as I think about how much of a difference I made or wasn't able to make, how much I contributed or didn't to their resolutions, and in the hope that there will be opportunities to strengthen your interest in all of these topics and more through our future engagements in the months ahead. But today, I thought it best to focus on the issues that have been salient in my mind even during the past half year of no work responsibilities and much rest and family time. That is climate change and life on earth, the weakening solidarity of humanity and the kind of leaders needed to take up these existential challenges and guide us to a better place than where we are today. I will be brief and speak broadly than specifically to leave as much time as possible for Q&As and to hearing from you. On the broad horizon, looking at major problems around the world, there is no question that man-made climate change is truly an existential crisis for the future of humanity on this planet, requiring the concerted effort on the part of all individuals, civil society actors, religious leaders, scientists and researchers, businesses and industries, local and central governments, regional and international organizations to change course. This is not just about temperature rises, but also about alarming levels of biodiversity loss and environmental degradation. Pope Francis reminds us in his 2015 landmark writing, Laudato Si, be praised. God always forgives, man sometimes forgives, and nature never forgives. We've done too much injury to nature. And unless we heal this injury and restore what some now call planetary health embracing all life on Earth, humanity's future on this planet lies in peril. The 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change was a remarkable outcome of intergovernmental negotiations at the United Nations, but action and pledges of action around the world to realize its goal of keeping global temperature rise to well under two degrees from pre-industrial age is still very short. According to the recent IPCC report, the world will probably reach or exceed 1.5 degrees of warming within just the next two decades in almost all emissions scenarios. And the worst case scenario predicts global warming of up to 5.7 degrees by the end of the century. And without reaching net zero CO2 emissions by 2050, along with strong reductions in other greenhouse gases, the climate system will continue to warm. And due to man-made threats of climate change, environmental degradation, and habitat losses, biodiversity on our planet is under severe threat, with the extinction of huge chunks of plant and animal species already happening, and still much more on the horizon. Biodiversity loss has received much less attention than climate change, but it could be even more difficult to reverse the trend than to halt temperature rises. So scientists and policymakers are now talking with the aim of getting an international agreement to preserve at least 30% of land and 30% of oceans so as to prevent further losses to biodiversity. There is much discussion and preparation currently going on for the next big UN conference on climate change, that is COP26 in November in Glasgow. And the stakes couldn't be higher. And much hope rides on the success of the conference 
to generate bolder, stronger pledges by individual countries to cut greenhouse gas emissions and to deliver the climate financing needed by developing countries. But this is not assured. There has been much civic activism and education around climate change, but much more is needed to persistently push, government, push, push for government policies and industrial action to achieve bold and even radical energy transition needed to curb greenhouse gas emissions. And also needed as action at the everyday level by individuals, all of us, to change behaviors in consumption and waste. Consumerism has fueled economic growth that has brought us development and prosperity. It has become an all-encompassing tenor of our lives, and it will be extremely difficult to tone it down or subdue it, especially for countries like Korea that have thrived on this model for economic growth. Every day, we are bombarded with messages and cues that we should buy more, use more, throw away more, and much if not most of all this more, is climate unfriendly and harmful to the environment. Just think of all the disposable but undegradable hand towels we use and throw away these days, which are just one of countless end products of the petrochemical industry, which is one of the main culprits in man-made climate change. And it is not a long way from clogged sewage drains, ocean garbage, and dump sites that these towels end up to the detriment our, of our planetary health. Climate and planetary health action is a responsibility for everyone. And if climate change is a physical and tangible threat to planetary health and humankind's place in it, I see an equally dangerous but intangible threat to our future in the fraying of the fundamental value that keeps us together as one humanity. That is, human dignity and the sanctity of human life. There is a great irony in our times. Even as the language of human rights has penetrated into the lives and consciousness of everyday people around the world, human life has become all too cheap and human dignity too quickly cheapened. For example, in the initial months of the civil war in Syria just 10 years ago, the world was shocked at the news of a teenage boy's body with clear markings of torture returned to his parents. Successive months witnessed civilians being targeted by snipers on rooftops, defecting soldiers being shot in the back. A few years later, the story of the body of a small boy washed up on the shore just one of many victims lost at sea while trying to reach Europe on a flimsy boat generated much sympathy and outrage around the world. But more generally, apart from these isolated moments, the ongoing violence and loss of civilian lives in Syria, Yemen, Ethiopia, and so many other places of simmering conflict and strife hardly makes the news. And if, even if we do see an occasional headline, it barely lasts until the next news cycle. Mass loss of human lives and human suffering in wars, social turmoil, terrorist attacks, natural and man-made disasters have become mundane events. We may pay attention to these for a while, but most of us go on with our lives, preoccupied with our own happiness and well-being. In this context, terrorism and violent extremism and ideologies that dismiss the sanctity of life are gaining force in countries with weak institutions and corrupt governments. The unexpectedly quick fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban recently is sure to embolden other extremist groups around the world that have no qualms about resorting to violence and brutality to advance their goals. Authoritarianism is getting the upper hand and dictatorships are becoming more repressive. Meanwhile, democracies that have stood up for human rights are ailing and weighed down by divisive electoral politics. 
And in losing our sense of injustice at the suffering of others far away, we have also weakened the impulse to guard our own human rights and dignity. How do we overcome this tide against human dignity and solidarity? I think we begin by going back to the fundamentals of what makes for a thriving democracy. And the fathers of the French Revolution gave us the perfect anchors, liberty, equality, and fraternity. These three anchors must stand strong together for countries built on the will of the people to be healthy and happy. And in many of our countries, they have long ceased to do so. Liberty has turned into reckless freedoms, equality has been losing ground, and fraternity seems all but missing. Professor Michael Sandel has given us a penetrating analysis of how this warring state of affairs has come about in his book, The Tyranny of Merit. Meritocracy, he points out, has made our democracy unequal and individualistic to the detriment of the pursuit of the common good. I don't think Professor Sandel is saying we should therefore abandon meritocracy altogether, but that too much of a good thing has really turned bad. Indeed, meritocracy that celebrates individual talent and drive is necessary to advance human rights and public goods. But it has to be matched by the spirit of fraternity as embodied in institutions and policies to make and keep the playing field level and to give an extra boost to the less endowed and fortunate. But in our current democracies, the voices are loud in demanding my rights and the rights of my group, but silent on your rights and the rights of your group. Human rights advocacy has been skewed toward liberty and equality to the detriment of fraternity. There are humanitarian voices pleading for support for the most vulnerable members and groups of humanity. But human rights and humanitarian assistance are different. I see them as two sides of the same co coin called human dignity. Siblings born of the same womb, but driven by different impulses into different lines of work and mission. So at the UN also, the human rights community and the humanitarian community are closely related but separate. And sometimes the tension between the two can be detrimental to the cause of human dignity. Human rights groups criticize humanitarians for turning a blind eye to abusive governments. And humanitarians accuse human rights activists as irresponsible idealists. But both are needed to shore up the spirit of fraternity and human dignity in our societies and the world. In the midst of this unhappy global scene, the Republic of Korea has been bucking the trend in many ways. Our democracy is vibrant and energetic, and human rights are fully guaranteed thanks to the civil society activism, which is hard to match anywhere. And in the midst of growing superpower rivalry and North Korea's growing nuclear capability, we have striven to pave the way to lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. And we are an increasingly important player in overseas development assistance. Furthermore, in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, while consistently calling for international solidarity, we have demonstrated how a government with strong administrative capacity and firm commitment to the safety and security of the people can deal with the pandemic based on the democratic principles of openness, transparency, and civic engagement. But inequality is growing and fraternity is fraying in our country too. Indeed, we are one of the most unequal countries in the OECD. And fraternity doesn't even seem to be relevant in the midst of polarized public debate in which voices calling for tolerance and the middle ground are being drowned out. And the problems are compounded by another challenge, which is particularly worrisome here because we are so digitalized. Let me elaborate. 
all over the world, we are letting go of fact-based, objective, truth-seeking. The plethora of digital media have made it too easy to generate and propagate falsehood and fake news in what many now call infodemics, and too easy for people to live in parallel universes, insulated from information that would contradict their beliefs. But the unmooring of public discourse from truth-seeking did not begin with social media. It started decades ago with the traditional media of print, radio, and television, when public figures began to put spins on their messages. Spinning messages to twist the perception of the recipient this way or that is not honest messaging. And we have become so used to it without even feeling the least bit uneasy about it. Cynics may say that it is naive to think that we can get back to the earlier age when freedom of the press was celebrated on the firm belief that it was vital for truth to emerge among competing views and that this was the best for social cohesion and progress. But we must try and consistently reaffirm the vital importance of facts and truth-seeking as the foundation of, of public life. Fake news and falsehood is challenging for all societies to tame, but more so for democracies than authoritarian governments. In fact, authoritarian regimes may exploit false information to shore up their legitimacy and steer popular opinion. But democratic governments that are accountable to the people and critically scrutinized by an independent press and civil society cannot do so. In other words, in this era of infodemics, the epic struggle for primacy vis-a-vis -vis authoritarianism has been made much harder for democracies that must guarantee the freedom of expression and the press. And we cannot take on the challenge without leaders at every level and all walks of life who are honest truthful and committed to encountering the tide of falsehood, as well as reviving the spirit of fraternity that applies beyond national borders and cultures. So let me now talk about leadership. I have been privileged to work with and for many top leaders with different styles, both men and women. I have worked for and seen up close in action many top leaders inside the country and on the global stage. Two presidents, four foreign ministers, four speakers of the National Assembly, two UN High Commissioners for Human Rights, two UN Emergency Relief Coordinators, three UN Secretary Generals, and several NGO leaders. In the process, I have developed a rather simple theory about leadership and what makes leaders effective. As I see it, there are three types of leaders leaderships, rather. To put it pl in plain terms, follow me, serve me, or work with me kinds of leadership. And of course, there are variations in each type, depending on individual style and the nature of the work and context. And the single leader may display characteristics of all three types. But at the risk of being too simplistic, let me describe them. Follow me leaders, are good at giving orders, but not good at receiving feedback or accepting criticism. Serve me leaders think staff work for them rather than the organization and are poor managers. Both follow me and serve me leaders are poor communicators. A key distinction between follow me and serve me leaders is that the former leads for the greater cause, while the latter for self-interest. Work with me leaders, build teams, empower and motivate staff, do not shy away from admitting error and taking responsibility, and are good listeners. They're also more truthful. Good team builders are all, also tend to be good team players in higher groups to which they belong. And needless to say, I've found the third type that is, leaders who are team builders and players to be most effective and honest 
and I have endeavored to lead accordingly as well. There are both women and men leaders of all three types, and there are good or bad women leaders, just as there are good or bad men leaders. Although I shy away from making sweeping generalizations about the difference between men and women in leadership, there is a whole line of research that looks at the difference, and it generally points to women leaders as being more communicative and transparent, consensus building and considerate, and less likely to be unilateral and opaque, hierarchical and competitive. And my own experience of working with and for both men and women leaders bears this out. But in the end, it is each individual leader, woman or man, girl or boy, who will juggle her or his responsibilities and determine her or his own leadership style. The point to make is that we need good leaders and more girls should grow up and more women should rise up to become not just women leaders, but good leaders. And while we may not need more men leaders, we certainly need more men to be good leaders. <coughs> As I conclude, how to get there, you ask. And I say, start where you are. One becomes a leader not by just wishing to become a leader, but by learning from good leaders and being good at what you do here and now and winning the trust and confidence of those around you. And I believe the Iwa campus is full of pedagogic, humanistic, and moral vigor to nurture the kind of leaders that our country and the world needs to ramp up action for climate change and planetary health to restore the spirit of fraternity and respect for human dignity, to counter infodemics as well as pandemics, and to deal with other challenges of our times. And I'm delighted to now have joined you in these efforts and very much look forward to an ongoing dialogue. And I hope our exchange today will be the beginning of a joyful process of my own continuing intellectual enrichment as well as yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kang, for a particularly thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I'm sure that we're going to have lots of questions, both uh, with our audience offline and our audience online. Uh, for the audience online, please do prepare your questions and send them in through Zoom. Uh, for the audience offline, I know you're ready to offer these questions, but we're just setting up the tables here. Uh, we'll be with you in just a moment. Okay, so we're going to start with questions from the audience offline, and I'm going to collect just a few questions to start with uh, for Professor Kang to, to think about and then answer collectively, if that's all right, Professor Kang. So uh, if you could raise your hands, and I will point to a few people with the hands up. Okay, one, two, three, please. Uh, dear Professor, thank you for the lecture today, and I'm also very delighted to be part of the same IHWA group as IHWA GSIS member. Um, I would like to ask, as an aspiring global female leader, have you ever experienced glass ceiling or glass wall that have hindered females from um, 
uh, appearing or having their capabili uh, capabilities on stage due to their gender. If you have, how are you able to overcome these factors? Thank you. Oh, sorry, and please introduce yourself oh, as well. My name is <laughs> Hang Eun, and I'm currently a third year at UWA GSIS. If I do have an opportunity, I would like to take your class next semester. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Professor. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank our department for this opportunity and Professor for such um, uh, insight insightful lecture. Um, my name is Brenda. I'm from Brazil. And um, this is my first semester at IHO GSIS. Um, so I'm going to speak from my point as a Brazilian. And I would like to make a question regarding my background. Um, so, as a Brazilian, I've always heard and studied about my country as a huge potential, and only potential. And um, considering its area, amount of population, and the size of economy, natural resources, and all of that. But visibly, um, that potential has been undermined by bad governments. Bad, bad governance. Um, especially now, during the pandemic and its economic consequences, leading to social and political instability and leaving people from our country very hopeless and with lack of solidarity, um, as Professor mentioned, about the future of our nation. Um, as someone who studies development, um, we get to see many examples of good and bad governments um, and how different countries with similar structure, structural conditions can have totally different um, development paths related to our um, depending on their leaders or institutions. So based on your experience and knowledge as a policy, policy maker, um, what are the areas um, a government or civil society organizations should invest on? And what kind of policies should we try to implement to strengthen factors such as female political participation and foster good, government, good governance practice in general? Thank you. Thank you. And if we may, Professor Kang, we'll just take one more for this round of questions uh, and then we can get your answers. Uh, hello, well, my name is Kai Park and I'm studying international relations at the IWAGA studies. And first of all, I'm very honored to participate in this lecture today. And as you mentioned in the lectures, you have played a variety of roles in, as a former foreign minister and a person who worked with a with the United Nations, Secretary General, and so on. So personally, I think in the rapidly changing international situations, the ability to quickly identify pending issues and respond accordingly is considered more important than anything else. So as a student studying international relations, I would like to ask for your advice on how to quickly identify variable international situations and problems and become an expert with the skills to find countermeasures accordingly. And thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Gang, a lot to think about there. Yeah. Well, tough ones. <laughs> thank you very much. They're all very, very thoughtful and, and thought provoking questions. Have I experienced glass ceiling? Definitely. Uh, in my uh, early part, earlier part of my career, um, and that was quite a while ago, but when I came back from um, the United States with advanced degrees, thinking of course everybody would welcome me to the campus, that was not to be. Uh, uh, you know, wherever I competed to get a university position, um, it was a male competitor who got the position in the end. And so, uh, as they say, I went around lecturing as a bag lady for several years. Uh, thinking that I would ultimately land a university job somewhere s at some point. So the, the glass ceilings at that time were much more visible, blunt, and, and uh, in your face. I think, you know, decades later, uh, the glass ceiling is more, more subtle. Uh, it's, it's more in the atmosphere um, and perhaps uh, not in the structure or the rules, but it's still there. Uh, and I think that's largely because 
Yes, women have advanced tremendously. Um, you know, women professors are now in all departments, whereas it, in my time, uh, you know, in the traditional hardcore academic fields, women were hard to find. But I think now we, you find women everywhere. In fact, the, the incoming uh, recruits and professionals are majority women these days. Uh, but they're, what women lack at, at, at being at a leadership level, we don't have the informal network of support. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, informal support uh, that men have. I didn't have that when I was in the foreign ministry. My male colleagues had that. So I think it's going to take a while before women sort of have, have equal support uh, that is there to help you out, to advise you, whatever. But currently, um, the, the, it's, it's a more of a subtle, subtle barrier uh, that hinders um, and all other things being equal, um, your advance uh, in whatever career uh, you might have. Um, I, I, I hesitate to comment directly on the situation in another country, especially coming <laughs> immediately from my former position as foreign minister. But I, I, I also ache uh, seeing what's happening in Brazil. I think, as you say, Brazil has tremendous potential and a tremendous energy of its people. But I think the pandemic uh, response has certainly been... Uh, very divisive, um, and I think I certainly feel the, the the frustrations of the people. But I also see strength in the Brazilians' um, judicial system. Um, I think uh, the court system has been quite principled, and and I think that certainly needs to be preserved. And in the end, it's the people who make the choices. Um, and you have many, some bad years of various big scandals of. Uh, of re, re, you know, involving lots of public figures. Uh, but in the end, I think the people have to make the right choice uh, in the kinds of leaders you want and how you may want to preserve and strengthen the key institutions that, that, uh, that provides the rule of law, uh, which in the end is, is what, what, um, what, what sustains and not the personalized style of politics that seems to be um, seem to have taken the country in the in the past few years how quickly to identify issues I think um, you need const I think there, if you go online and just uh, with a few clicks um, the major newspapers uh, they you know, you have to inculcate that habit of being in tuned with global developments. Um, things move so fast. Um, I, I still read every day the UN news clippings. Every day. Uh, and if you miss out per one week, things will move very quickly. So, and it's not easy to, to grow that habit. But I would, I would, whatever medium you're you're tuned into, whatever uh, news is your favorite. But I would certainly um, advise that, uh, at the minimum, uh, that should be a, a daily habit, and and based on that, um, to develop your deep expertise, deep knowledge of whatever specialized field that you would like to devote your life to. Is it climate change? Is it human rights uh, development? Um, and start from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I believe that Professor O oh has gathered some questions from our online participants. So I gathered uh, three questions from our online students. Uh, the first one is by Yi Golun. And she was very impressed um, by your work as the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And her question is, while you served as Minister of Foreign Affairs, when was the most rewarding and the most difficult time? Uh, the second uh, question is from Yaslin Gomez. And she said, there are three types of leaders, but how should we as future women leaders approach follow me leaders and serve me leaders once we go into the workforce? 
We want to bring the change, yet there are those types of leaders, so what is the best advice on how to handle them? And the third is by Ipek, and her question is, you talked about the three types of leaders and leadership, and she wants to know if you think there's a fourth type. And um, do you think there's a need for a new type of leadership to overcome the current issues? Perhaps a fourth type that combines two or all of the three or another type of leadership that you have in mind? Um, my, my three years and eight months as foreign minister, I think, was my toughest challenge. Every day was a challenge, but every day also was a thrilling and rewarding experience. And I am grateful for every day of those three years and eight months. There were many moments of uh, ups and many moments of downs. Uh, so I have a hard time thinking through what was the most rewarding and what was the most difficult. Um, I think the most difficult uh, was dealing with the, with the frictions with Japan. I think, uh, and I, I think that's one area I, that I felt most frustrated as I left the office, to find Korea-Japan relations where it currently is, uh, for many reasons. Um, but uh, especially when Japan announced the unilateral trade export restrictions on us in 2019, um, completely out of the blue. And dealing with that, I think, was a very tough challenge. Um, and, and we still have not moved on um, very much uh, beyond that, as far as the bilateral relations is concerned. What are the most rewarding? I think, um, I think the, the pandemic, of course, is still ongoing, and it's, a, it's still a huge challenge. But and I think the foreign ministry has stepped up to the plate in support of our nationals overseas, uh, in bringing them back home. Um, this was, you know, we acted like an emergency flight service. Uh, whatever it took to bring our people home if they wished to, whether it was chartered flights or getting them on somebody else's chartered flights, um, driving to the remote corners of a village in some Africa, and, and then making sure that they were driven to the airport. And so it was a lot of, lot of uh, effort on the part of uh, the staff on the ground, staff here. But I think I, I'm very happy, I'm proud of the foreign ministry staff, both at missions and headquarters of having, having, uh, having, having really delivered on that part of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and I think for a country as a whole, the, the way that we, you know, we were the second hard hit after China. And I think at, when we were hit, people were closing borders on us uh, almost every day. And we, at one point, we, I felt like we were becoming the pariah of the international community. But I think by overcoming that initial surge, um, you know, solidly staying on the principle of openness and transparency and civic, civic participation. You know, after a few months, the global community started to look at us. How did you come to grips with this? And being able to tell that story to the global audience was, uh, I didn't, you know, it wasn't me. It was our disease control and medical health. We're doing the excellent work. My job was to tell that story as it is to the international community, and that was a very proud moment as a, as a foreign minister. D follow me, serve me. If you, if you find yourselves under follow me and serve me leaders, what should you do? Well, I think, for, first of all, before you go into the world out there, um, you need to find good mentors. Um, and I always say, yeah, yeah, you can, you know, if you're a woman, you know, try to find a mentor in a man. If you're a man, try to find a mentor in a woman. Because I think that cross-gender experience is, is uh, enriching. Um, you know, of course, it's wonderful to have women mentors as well. So you have these people uh, that could help you when faced with 
the kinds of leadership that you don't truly appreciate. I think whether it's follow me, serve me, or work with me, if a leader, and, and I, as I say, and it's been, you can have all characteristics of all three. Uh, but in the end, what counts as a leader is that you motivate your crowd. You bring out the best in them. And that means you're respected. I don't think no, res no leader that is not respected by the crowd can perform to maximum. You have to be respected, which means you have to be good at what you do, and you have to empower and motivate staff. Uh, so, you know, the type of leadership I certainly have preferred and I wish to be is the, with, is the work with me. But there are follow me, serve me leaders who could generate the same kind of enthusiasm in, 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 in the crowd uh, and that will uh, also depend on the context and the nature of the work. For example, in a military, it's probably follow me works pretty well. Um, so I think, but you have to have your own judgment, your anchor, and your expectation, and, and at, at hopefully not be too afraid or fearful about telling your leader what you think he or she needs to hear for the benefit of the larger cause and the group. Easier said than done, but the point is you need to inculcate that sense of judgment and moral compass in you throughout your formative years. Fourth type, I don't know, this is just a three type, my simple theory, others may have five, six, seven types. I don't have a particular fourth type at this point, but perhaps, um, perhaps uh, with further observations I might. Uh, but again, these are just observations that I offer and I'm happy to discuss you um, with you how it might be further, further elaborated and developed. Thank you. Okay, so I think we, we have time for another round of questions. Uh, starting with those offline in this hall, do we have anyone else who would like to ask a question of Professor Gan? Microphone's on its way. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Karen Taliada from the Philippines. Uh, my question um, is that in order to formulate good leaders and to be good leaders, do you believe that advocacy and believing in empathy and the things that we fight for contributes in establishing these vital good leadership skills. Thank you. And I'll take any others in the hall. Oh, yeah, we've got enough for another round of three. So one behind and one in front. Thank you very much, Professor. My name is Christina and I'm from Indonesia. So I heard that you mentioned before about the concept of civic engagement. Uh, in my home country, we used to, uh, what do you call it, like, they are empowered to uh, have their own opinion about certain things, but like, the current issue that is happening domestically is like, some of the students, they find out, they, they think and they also perceive that the government is currently suppressing their opinion, and it raises a crisis. Uh, towards the freedom of opinion in my country. So I would like to ask your um, perception on that and what do you think will be better for us to do, especially as a civic, uh, civil society, and then me as a student who is studying abroad and what can I contribute to my country? Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you, Minister Kong. So my name is Nancy Kim. I'm a PhD student here at GSIS. And I was very inspired by your, your message about the need for more humanity, I guess, in leadership and in policymaking. And I think this question actually relates to the first question that was asked. So basically, I'm wondering if, do you believe that Korea has, for example, 
um, that this principle or this philosophy of humanity has infused Korea's foreign policy, or could it be doing more? So, for example, in its relations with Japan or in its ODA, do you feel that this notion of humanity um, could actually help to improve some of the ways in which Korea approaches other countries? Okay. Um, good leaders, empathy. Definitely. I think empathy is, um, you know, empathy in the sense that the ability to feel, put yourself in the other's shoes and, and to feel for and feel with. Um, and that, I think leaders have constantly to strive at it. Um, I think somehow human nature is, you know, human nature is self-centeredness. And it constantly requires you to work against that innate, uh, innate nature, uh, to move from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. And, and I think the empathy is what enables that. And you have to strive to inculcate that in you. And you, know, you can do it in many ways, uh, but I think being a good listener is absolutely necessary. Uh, you know, you have to listen and you have to, you have to try to understand uh, what the other is saying. Good leaders, uh, I've seen many leaders who think leadership is about telling uh, and not listening. Uh, and maybe that may have worked in the past, uh, um, but I, I think in this day and age, depending, varying degrees, uh, depending on the context, I think Leaders have to be good listeners, and that's the minimum requirement of, of, of uh, being an uh, empathetic leader. Um, Indonesia, uh, I think civic engagement is, is, uh, is the lifeblood of democracies, civil society activism. Uh, and that is, I think, what is the big plus of our democracy here. All kinds of civil society groups are active, loud, demanding, and that's what keeps the government on our toes, even during the pandemic. And, and, and we very much hope to see that in other democracies. I think the context is different. The history of the democratic involvement is different for Korea, for Indonesia. But I, you know, that, however you you nurture that, especially as um, educated people, uh, graduates of colleges and universities, uh, with the knowledge of, of other countries. Uh, it's very much also a responsibility on you uh, to make sure that you are civically engaged and civil, civic activism in your country stays, uh, becomes and stays alive. Um, Humanity in Korea's foreign policy. I think we have a lot more that we can do. Um, I think Korea's foreign development assistance, for example, now integrates gender uh, dimension into all the projects that uh, we support through COICA and other, uh, other development uh, entities out there. Uh, beyond that, I think uh, the value added dimension of our foreign policy is still very weak, frankly. And we can, we can do a lot more. Uh, our relations with Japan is, is, I think, complicated to put it mildly. But of course, uh, the big issues of the victims uh, of the past, the, the victims of the comfort women, the forced labor victims, these are, you know, these are our, 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 our people, many of them are still here with, you know, very vivid memories of, of the suffering. And as government, I think we, it's only responsible that we, we, we honor them uh, and we try to support them as much as possible. But in the end, what they want is some serious and sincere action from Japan. And that has not been forthcoming. 
I think Japan has apologized uh, in various forms over the years, but the sincerity of those apologies have, have been very much questioned. Um, and so uh, I do hope that, uh, I, I think Japan is a, in many ways we share much, uh, both democracies, uh, I think we, we very much need to find a way beyond this impasse, but in a way that honors and uh, ensures that the dignity of the victims are, 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 are reclaimed. Thank you. Professor O, do we have some more online questions? Yes, um, I have three more questions. Uh, the first is from Ms. Uh, Zul Jargar from Mongolia, and she writes, Korea recently became a developed country officially. In your opinion, what was the main essence of this success? The second question is from Janessa Gilly, and she asks, in light of the infodemics and the ensuing division, which type of leader do you think will be the most effective when it comes to truly tackling the immense challenges of climate change? And the third question is uh, from Manon, and her question is, you mentioned earlier that it would be beneficial to find a mentor and to find informal support, which you mentioned is not easy to get as a woman. Would you have any advice on how to find a good mentor and have more chances to receive this informal support? Okay, how, do we, how did Korea develop from one of the poorest um, countries to a developed status. Uh, I think, you know, Korea is resource poor. Um, and I think what drove us is the education uh, fervor of the people. Excessive in many ways, but still without uh, the, the drive of the education and the human resources uh, that uh, our education system has produced, uh, I don't think we would be where we are. But I read um, Professor Sandel's book and have to ask myself, you know, this intense competition for college degrees, for certificates, for credentials. Um, it's come to a time where Korea as a society also has to reflect on whether this model of uh, economic growth and development will sustain us into the future. I don't think so. I think there has to be more of the, the distributed side to our uh, wealth. Um, I think the current government has done a, has much to push government policies in that direction, but I think much more needs to be done. But education, if I had to choose one ingredient, education. Um, infodemics, the kinds of leaders we need for climate change in the infodemics. Well, I think climate change is, um, and, you know, I think what is needed is the bold energy transition. I know that we've, Korea just passed the basic law on carbon neutrality, which says a minimum 35% reduction from the 2018 baseline by 2030, at a minimum of 35. And that is really just a minimum. Uh, I think to really live up to our, our pledge of carbon neutrality by 2050, we have to go beyond that minimum. And I know there are intense discussions within government about whether it's minimum is a minimum, all we need to do is a minimum, or no, we need to go way beyond that to 40%, 50%. There is very, I, the discussion is intense, I know, as we try to, um, forge what we can say at COP26 in November. Um, but it requires, first of all, it requires bold political will on the top of the leader, our president and the government and the ministers involved, to set a policy, as difficult as it may be, because without that, we're not going to be making that transition. We are still 60% dependent on, on coal for our energy. And to go from here to neutrality in 2050, it's going to take a lot of pain, a lot of sacrifice, and, and 
uh, top leadership, first of all, but of course, the consuming public and energy users to very much go along and support with that, that efforts at the transition. Mentoring not easy as women. You know, in the foreign ministry, therefore, I tried to, I, tr I introduced a program of mentorship uh, as part of um, you know, really firing up the ministry to be more, more uh, gender equality sensitive and work-life balance. So I don't know, I don't know if it's still going, but by you know, matching senior leaders with a junior and, and to make sure that they interact for six months or so. Um, we made it part of our efforts to for uh, ministries innovation. I think you know it would be easy to institute something like that in an academic setting. Um, you know, so how how to do that would be uh, uh, you know you would have to work out the details. But if you want mentorship, we should we we should find a way to see that met, that demand be met, and I think that that falls on the shoulders of all the faculty members um, and, and supporters, the research assistant, to see how that might be, that might be, um, that we might bring that about. Thank you. Okay, I think we still have some time for further questions. Uh, anyone, it, yes, there's one in the audience here. Any more? Okay, so we'll just take Asya for now. Hello. Hello, Professor Kang. Thank you so much for coming. I just want to say that there's a lot of interest in you coming to IHWA outside of GSIS because I have friends from all other departments who have asked me how they can come, how they can participate. They couldn't, sadly, but it's not just GSIS. A lot of friends from entire IHWA are very, very excited to have you here. My question to you, oh, I'm sorry. My name is Asya. I'm from Croatia. I'm a PhD student here. My question to you concerns leadership. And it's a question I ask a lot of uh, policymakers and people in the government when I get the chance. Um, when you are in the position that you are as a leader, how much of what you want to do were you really able to achieve and how much were you constrained by various factors? Maybe to clarify a lot of the times when I've learned about public diplomacy, most of what I heard there is, in fact, what you have said, the best thing works when you listen to people, not just when you spread the message, but when you listen what actually the people need. But then after listening, you know what happens. Even if you listen to a message, how much are you able to then implement? So I'm sure there were many things you wanted to change in the foreign ministry and in many of the positions. I'm just curious, how much were you actually able to do? Thank you. Well, that's, as I, I think I said that up front, I asked myself, uh, as I think through these issues, how much of a difference did I make or didn't? How much did I contribute to the resolutions? If you think of the issues, not much. Um, well, the issues still very much loom large, the big issues on our foreign policy agenda, the North Korea's nuclear issue, the U.S.-China competition, but of course, foreign policy is, it, you, it's, you, you, much about all of these issues is beyond your control. It's, it's, you have multiple partners, you know, your foreign minister sitting on the other side, and he has lots of going on in the back of his mind, his crowd, his leader, and there are other countries. So doing foreign policy is like juggling six different things at the same time, because what you say you have to think of how it lands with the domestic audience, the politicians, my president, the, the other side, their domestic audience, other countries. So it's, 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 it's a lot of balancing act, um, but somebody has to do it. And I think as far as our policy is concerned, how much did I make a, an impact on Korea's foreign policy? And there, you're also constrained by other players around the table, other ministries, um, and, and, and the, the po political influence of the National Assembly. 
I, I think I've, I've made some important marks. Um, but of course, I will not divulge them because a policy is a policy. Once made, it's there, and you don't speak say, well, I didn't agree to that. There are many things that I didn't agree to. But as the foreign minister of this government, of course, and I would, I would, I would uh, advocate for the policy to, the, to, the, to the, my partner across the table. But yes, policy is not one ministry. It's multiple ministries coming together and, 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 and sorting through the difficult uh, issues and the differences, and there are lots of differences. Um, and but I think foreign policy has always been at the forefront, trying to meet, match that policy as close as possible to the global standards and norms, because we are the interface between the domestic debate and the global standards. And this is, in fact, what's happening with climate change, human rights development assistance. And as foreign minister, uh, I, this was in fact one of the ways I, I consistently try to pull our policies closer to the global standards uh, because that's the only way we can, we can win trust, we can win friends, and we can win supporters uh, in the international community. Final round of questions online. Okay, uh, so there, we have three questions online. And the first one is from Ms. Dorazio de Cruz. And she asks, what is an urgent change that women leaders should pursue uh, for gender equality? And the second is from Ms. Dewey. And her question is, um, as a human rights lawyer, I considered environmental rights as part of human rights. I would like to ask, despite of sovereignty reason, how we as an international community make developing countries like my home country, Indonesia, uh, to put political will and bigger effort to tackle climate crisis. And she asked whether you think climate financing um, can be a solution. And the third question is from Ms. Nishibiro. And she asks, as an international student from Japan, I would like to ask you about Korea-Japan relationship more. What do you think our generation can do to help solve this conflict? Um, uh, we'll, we'll change. When what urgent change? Um, I, I can't think of an urgent change, but I certainly can think of an urgent situation, which is the situation of uh, women and girls in Afghanistan. Um, I think since um, the fall of the previous Taliban government for the past 20 years, uh, with the support of the international community, women and girls have made huge advances uh, there are now professionals, there are universities, and, and not only the, the safety uh, of these women are now threatened, the future of, of women and girls uh, uh, very much threatened, and the reversal of all that gains. So I think uh, we need to put you know, urgent, you know, persistent focus on what's happening in, in Afghanistan. And there are lots of women's groups. I'm one of them. Uh, we have Zoom sessions. Uh, uh, we may not be able to do much or have that much of an impact, but I think you know, we need to be concerned and, and support the women when, uh, in Afghanistan. I am just so heartened uh, at the, their courage, uh, even under, you know, they put their lives on the line to come out to the streets and demand that the, the place that they have worked so hard to build uh, be preserved. Um, it's, it's a very touchy situation. Um, but I think the stronger the voices of the international community speaking on behalf of the women and girls, uh, the better the chances that uh, they will be protected. Environmental rights, uh, human rights, um, 
Definitely climate financing is the one unrealized promise of, 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 of that whole accord. I think there was an agreement to provide $100 billion per year to develop, developing countries to support them to make that transition. And I don't think that promise has been met by, by any, any, any stretch of the imagination. So I think the Copenhagen summit this time will have to deliver more concretely on the climate financing side of the deal as well. Uh, Japan, Korea, what can the current generation do? I think keep up the ties. I think uh, not all exchanges between Korea and Japan are political, although it is very easily uh, roped into that uh, toxic mix. Keep up the, the changes, keep up your friendship, keep up the, the cultural ties, keep up uh, how, you know, whatever, whatever discussions you might be able to have uh, and help each other get a, a broader picture of history. Uh, they have their view of history. Uh, they've grown up in a certain version of history, which certainly we don't buy. Uh, but, and we have our, uh, our understanding of history, and it only through dialogue, um, open dialogue, uh, perhaps removed the, from the daily calculations of the, the immediate political leaders at the front light of diplomacy. I think that will, in the end, be very beneficial uh, to the bilateral ties. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we... Do we have a few more quick No, we So thank you, Professor Kang, for such an enlightening talk. And I certainly look forward to learning more from you now you've joined us at IWA GSIS. Mm. Uh, and we will ask you to speak again, no doubt. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, it's been very engaging. And thank you for all of your comments and questions. Thank you.